It's a pleasure to welcome you today's discussion on inventing and patenting. We want to focus on diversity issues. My name is Holly Fechner, and I'm the executive director of Invent Together. Invent Together is an initiative supported by organizations, universities, companies, and other stakeholders dedicated to understanding the gender, race, and other diversity gaps in invention and patenting, and to supporting public policy and private initiatives to close them. Inventing and patenting play a critical role in our economy. Inventors who hold patents benefit from higher incomes, new job and promotion opportunities, broader social networks, and heightened prestige. Businesses that hold patents enjoy higher revenues and higher rates of job creation. Invent Together believes that everyone should have the opportunity to invent and patent. Today, we're going to hear about new research for, from the Institute for Women's Policy Research that examines the experiences of women in invention, including both the challenges they face, as well as best practices that help them on their invention journeys. This important new research adds to what we already know about diversity in inventing and patenting. Let me briefly share some statistics about where we are today in the United States. The US Patent and Trademark Office and leading researchers, including IWPR, have found large and disturbing patent gaps. In 2019, less than 13% of all inventors who held a US patent were women. And women hold only 5.5% of commercialized patents, those patents that are able to create job, jobs and make money. Black and brown college graduates hold patents at less than half the rate of white college graduates. And patenting activity by black inventors peaked in 1899 and has not recovered since. And astoundingly, children in families in the top 1% of income are 10 times more likely to patent as adults than children in the entire bottom half of family income. So we know that closing these patent gaps would offer meaningful benefits both to individuals and societies as a whole, increasing the number of women, people of color, and low income individuals who patent would help close wage and wealth gaps, increase the gross domestic uh, product by almost a trillion dollars a year, and lead to exciting new and different inventions. Over the past few years, Invent Together has worked with inventors, academics, organizations, and industry representatives and others to make progress on these issues. And we do that through a number of ways by supporting research such as we're going to be sharing today and convening roundtables to strategize about how to make progress on these issues. We also champion in the Success Act, which require the US Patent and Trademark Office to study and report on the available data on the number of patents applied for and obtained by women, racial and ethnic minorities and veterans and to make recommendations for how to diversify patenting and entrepreneurial activity. We encourage you to learn more about this issue by visiting our website at inventtogether.org and by following us on Twitter at inventtogether. So first today, we're gonna hear from Elise Shaw, a study director at IWPR and the primary author of this new report Elise will provide us with an overview of her findings. And I want to encourage you to use that question and answer button, which is uh, on the right of your screen. If uh, questions uh, pop into your mind, just throw them in the chat. Uh, we're taking a look at the conversation in the chat and we look forward to, uh, to bringing your questions into the discussion uh, later. Um, and after Elise present, presents her findings, 
will be joined by three amazing women inventors who are going to be uh, sharing their experiences. And they are three of the women who were interviewed for the report that Elise is going to, to share with us today. So with that introduction, let me now turn to uh, Elise. So as I said, Elise Shaw is a study director at the Institute for Women's Policy Research. She directs IWPR's projects on the status of women in the United States, women's political participation, and the projects that IWPR has on related to women and girls of color, where she examines and focuses on the intersectional nature of race and gender. Elise also manages IWPR's research on increasing gender and racial equity in patenting, innovation, and entrepreneurship. And of course, she is the co-author of the report that we're focused on today, which is called Closing the Gender Gap in Patenting, Innovation, and Commercialization, Programs Promoting Equity and Inclusion. Welcome, Elise, and we look forward to hearing more about your new report. Thank you so much, Holly, for that wonderful introduction. I'm really, really excited to talk today about this vitally important topic and to share IDPR's latest research. As we know, innovation is a hallmark of American culture, and yet women and people of color are woefully underrepresented as inventors. A greater diversity of perspectives is definitely essential to discovering solutions to some of the world's biggest challenges. And these are challenges we're seeing today, such as pandemic outbreaks, food insecurity, and climate change. I know that Holly went over a few of these statistics, um, but I think that it's really important to understand kind of the state of where we're at with the di diversity and the lack of diversity in intellectual property and patenting. Um, as she said, in, in 2019, about 21.9% of patents had at least one woman inventor on it. Um, this is an increase from 2010 when it was about 20%. So it's a very slow rate of progress that we're seeing on these issues. And at the current rate of progress, women will have to wait between 75 and 100 years for parity and patenting, depending on which analysis you look at. Um, when we look at innovation and IP among women entrepreneurs, we see that th there's a huge impact on women when it comes to lower rates of patenting. Women-owned businesses are less likely than their male-owned counterparts to own intellectual property rights, and patents tend to be concentrated in industries where there are fewer women-owned businesses. Yet at the same time, <laughs> women-owned businesses have that have at least a patent pending have average revenues of more than 16 times those without IP holdings. That's a huge difference in revenues. And they help these intellectual property holdings help attract startup capital, which means women-owned businesses are adversely affected because of their lower rates of patenting. Um, Men-owned businesses are twice as likely to have a million or more than women-owned businesses when it comes to startup capital. So this just so shows some of the real life implications of the lack of gender and racial diversity in patenting to both the individual and the economy. As Holly said, I'm going to be talking about our latest research on this issue. Um, our previous research really didn't dig into the whys of the patenting gap. So we dug further into that with this report. We are really looking at the experiences of women and particularly of women of color when it comes to innovation and patenting. So quickly, the research goals. We really wanted to look at what are the most common challenges and barriers that women and specifically women of color face throughout the patenting process. Also, what are the most crucial supports for inventors and who are the main gatekeepers to patenting? Those were our key questions that we were looking at here. So what did we do? We did 21 in-depth interviews with 16 women, 11 whom, of whom were women of color and five male inventors. Um, interviews were conducted with participants that spanned a wide range of inter industries, geographic locations. I think they cover about 14 states, ages, and stages of their career. And interviews, in, interviewees discussed experiences patenting in academia, within corporations, and on their own as part of their own entrepreneurial endeavors. So we really tried to cover a broad swath with just these 21 interviews. So what did we find? 
really a lot of these stories that we heard from the women highlighted the systemic barriers to innovation and patenting. Every woman interviewed shared multiple stories of the way stereotypes and discrimination and bias, whether conscious or unconscious, impacted them in their careers. So we have this bias from a wide range of actors as well, including advisors, supervisors, peers, colleagues, investors, and patenting attorneys. Women are facing these biases in every area as they go through the PIS the process. Um, some even reported experiencing sexual harassment um, as well. This comes from peers, colleagues, and even investors. Women of color in, in STEM fields also reported facing experience additional you know, race and gender biases, which can be difficult to overcome given that many of these women are often the only in the room, either the only woman or the only woman of color. And women who are the only are more likely to have negative experiences in the workplace, including having their abilities challenged and feeling like they're a stand-in for all women and women of color and must you know, meet that high standard to kind of represent all women. And most of the women and all of the men interviewed attributed some of the lack of diversity in patenting to the lack of women and women of color in STEM. This lack of gender and racial diversity comes even as women continue to graduate with STEM degrees at increasingly high rates. Um, really what this points to is the structural barriers within the workplace that often push women into non-patent or non-R&D uh, intensive areas or push them out of the industry altogether. Women often pay, face a motherhood penalty and have work-life balance issues. And so we're just seeing a lot of different issues that, that keep women from patenting and innovating at the same rate as their male colleagues. Another thing that really resonated and came up with all of the patent patent uh, holders that we interviewed was the lack of formal formal education. Um, this tends to seem to impact women more adversely than men. So none of the inter interventors we interviewed received any sort of formal education, you know, in high school or college on the patenting process. Um, Five women reported that they did not even understand what constituted intervention when they first began. And this was something that was kind of really interesting to me to hear that they said, oh, you know, we're innovating all the time and I didn't even know it was an invention. Um, a number of women also spoke about that the lack of the formal education meant that they didn't know where to go for resources about patenting when they were first trying to start out. They, you know, had to Google and rely on things like that where they just didn't have the connections they needed to understand what is the system. And this leads to a lack of confusion throughout the patenting process, including, you know, for many, what it means to receive a rejection from the USPTO. Many of the women said they didn't understand when a rejection was truly a rejection and when it was an opportunity to refine and resubmit their ideas. Um, this lack of understanding followed many of our female inventors throughout their careers. And it just really highlights the importance of mentors and networks to support women throughout their innovation and patenting career. So the importance of informal education and mentoring is essential to women's success. And while when many of the women we spoke to had support over the years, they said, you know, they have great networks now. A lot of these women also reported having to work harder to build their networks and find mentors. In fact, 14 of the 16 women interviewed said they had to work harder to find resources, mentors, and build networks to help them succeed. As you can see from this quote here, um, one of the women we spoke to said, I feel like I had a lot of support, but I had to find that and I had to look for the opportunities. Things didn't just happen. I had to really go out of my way to learn and, and get the opportunities for myself. So it's really a lot of energy and effort to build these networks. So what we also found is gatekeepers to patenting matter, and they can often be the difference between success and failure to patenting. Um, more than mentorship, young female inventors need someone often in the room, we say, who is a sponsor to advocate on their behalf. Um, a lot of women, when they're first starting out, um, young inventors, are not in the room when it comes to be decision time of who gets named on the patent. And this really can exclude a lot of women. We even heard of a story where one of the women we interviewed didn't find out about patenting until she found out that her advisor uh, 
patented their invention together without her. <laughs> so they invented this thing and he patented it without her. And so she wanted to learn what was patenting. What is this all about? How do I do this? Um, we found the most important gatekeepers for inventors include supervisors and academic advisors who help ensure that women, and particularly women of color, get credit on patents early on in their careers. Patent attorneys, obviously, they help guide women inventors through the legalese of patent applications, but they can also be a barrier if bias and unconscious bias creep in. Um, and oftentimes women reported having to spend more time kind of meeting the patent attorney where they are. So really explaining the difference between the legal jargon and the technical language to make sure the patent is the patent application reflects their idea accurately. And then in the academic setting, there's technology transfer offices, which often take the, the burden and time um, off of the academics who are trying to patent and the, these academics then don't have to spend the money. But again, bias can creep in toward you know, established inventors who have already proven have a good track record with the technology transfer office, and that can make it difficult for new academics to utilize the resources, especially young women. We also looked at, you know, like I said, a range of areas in which inventors invent. So we noticed that the challenges and supports that women need in different is different in different settings. It's not the same across the board. So one of the areas we looked specifically at is academia. And women who patent within the academic setting reported that technology transfer offices are both a major asset, like I said, but can be a major barrier. Um, while they offer vital supports and resources, you know, they give oftentimes the older men <laughs> who have been patenting for a long time preference. Um, there's also limited opportunities for these inventors to benefit financially, given that the IP is then owned by the academic institution. Um, women have reported that they're less likely to have the resources to buy the IP from the university if they want to go out on their own and start their own entrepreneurial endeavor outside of the university. Um, this can really put financial constraints on these women if they're trying to do that on their own. And finally, depending on the different fields, um, patents are often not valued as highly as academic papers when it comes to tenure consideration. This often, we, we heard, disincentivizes women from pursuing patents in the academic arena, given that women in academia often have increased demands on their time. They're often part of different committees, they have different responsibilities, and if patenting is seen as extracurricular, they may not have the ability to do that, especially given the increased work-life balance issues that women face when it comes to caregiving for their family and things like that, those external <laughs> considerations that we always have to take into consideration when we're talking about women, especially women who are mothers. We talked to women in the corporate setting, we heard something similar. Corporations provide access um, to and often pay for patent attorneys. So this makes it easier for inventors to patent within a corporation. However, a lot of the discussion we had around in this area was understanding that often office politics is crucial for new women inventors. Understanding this, the, how the office works is essential. Um, and we heard that's essential for women to go beyond their immediate supervisor and develop deep relationships with other inventors in the corporation, build mentors, get mentors outside of their immediate area, and to even build relationships with the corporate patent attorneys. Um, as you can see again from this tech, this quote here, that you know, a lot of women think, I'm doing the job, my line manager will make sure I, that whatever needs to happen happens, you know, I'll get on a patent, not realizing that there's a whole other system that they have to learn and understand in order to tap into all of the resources they really need in order to successfully patent their ideas within their corporation. This means that finding mentors and building networks beyond your immediate supervisor is so crucial. But like we heard before, that's harder work for a lot of women to do. And then we've looked at women who are on their own patenting and really working to have their own entrepreneurial endeavors. Um, unsurprisingly to most people probably who know this area, funding is the major barrier for inventors, given 
the high cost of quality patent attorneys, limited access to pro bono services. While there are some out there, oftentimes they're not available, readily available to everyone. And then the cost of defending any IP rights once you have the patent. Um, this can be a financial burden that is really difficult for a lot of women inventors to overcome. This is really tied to the lack of venture capital investments and seed money that often goes to startups um, led by you know white women and then particularly women of color there's just they just get such a small percentage of this of this money which means they rely more on grants they rely on more their own or their family's wealth and investments and really this compounding issue of the gender and racial wage and wealth gaps means women have less access to capital and personal resources to rely on to fill these funding gaps. So this is funding is the, really the main area here that women talked about, the main barrier. So this is just some really brief overall, you know, look at the research that we have done here. Um, our report, which is available on IWPR's website, um, already. There's key findings document there as well, the full report. It really goes into depth and I really suggest that everyone check it out to read more of the stories, hear more about what the women directly say. There's a lot of quotes in there and great things that I would love for their, these stories to stand on their own. Um, but what do we, where do we go from here? Um, you know, we heard overall from women that while some of the women we interviewed felt they really had gained personally from patenting, others felt that the challenges outweighed the benefits. They didn't see as many benefits. We had stories of women who said, I wasn't able to you know, start my own entrepreneurial inventor. I have this patent, but nothing really came of it. I changed careers. So there's a lot of things that go, on, go into this. And though women have patents, it doesn't necessarily mean they're benefiting. Um, women face numerous barriers to patenting that their male counterparts don't experience. And a lot of these are structural and systemic and really need a big picture changes. Um, and then at the intersection of gender and race, women of color face additional barriers in patent intensive fields. And really we need to make sure that we're acknowledging and addressing these issues. Um, tackling the gender and racial patenting gaps will take concerted effort from a wide range of actors and a wide range of individuals. So again, the report goes into this a lot more in depth, but here's a list of kind of our policy recommendations um, that kind of span a whole range of acting. So there's multiple entry points where we can do this. One that we talked that Holly mentioned briefly is more research, including collecting demographic data. Right now, a lot of the data we have on the share of women um, and people of color who are patent is based on algorithms that identify you by name. Um, the collection of data on who is actually patenting by the USPTO would be vital to any sort of research, research out there. We could look at what is going on for black women, what is going on for Latino women, things like that. Um, we really need to establish programs that promote early exposure to STEAM for all women, particularly women of color. Developing a formal curriculum on the patenting process that can be utilized by academic institutions, even starting as young as high school or middle school to really expose our youth to what it is to patent. What does that mean? What does that look like? Would be phenomenal. And then organizations, corporations, and academic institutions and, and the government um, should do internal audits uh, regarding conscious and unconscious bias. This is even USPTO, and I know they have some initiatives on this already. They're really looking into it, and it's great to see that this is getting going, um, but really working to root out bias um, from processes and systems is crucial and key to making sure that there's equality for everyone who's trying to access them. And then you can get broader too. invest in childcare policies and that promote and policies that promote work life balance and keep women in the workplace. We need universal access to affordable and quality childcare. And these are all crucial supports for women in the workplace overall. And then the last few provide additional funding for government run um, programs, especially pro bono access to patent attorneys, expanding these programs and really making it accessible would be fantastic to help all women patent their ideas. 
and then increase flexibility in government grant funding. Um, many of the entrepreneurs we spoke with discussed the limits on SBIR and STTR grant funds, which only allow inventors to spend money on patenting in phase two grants. So really looking at these programs and seeing how can we invest more in funding that goes specifically to women, women of color who are really working on innovation, patenting and entrepreneurship really need to focus on, on a lot of those issues. Um, like I said, this is just an overview and please check out the report for more information. Um, and as Holly said, if you have any questions for me, I will be sticking around. Please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, would love to hear more from you all on this great research. Thank you so much, Elise. Boy, it just really shows to me how much we can learn by listening to women. Uh, women's experiences, uh, it matters so much. Of course, we can look at the numbers and we need to look at the numbers um, and, and we need to ensure that the numbers are collected. Um, but your research, your qualitative research shows that listening to women's experiences points us in the direction uh, of the right policy solutions. So I now want to turn and bring in our three incredible women inventors. Um, they are some of the women who have overcome these various barriers that Elise talked about, and we want to engage them in conversation now with you. And please do uh, put questions in the Q and A if uh, if you have them. So first, I want to introduce um, Dr. Maria Artun Duega, who is a translational physician scientist and CEO with expertise in bioengineering, public health, implementation science, and leading NSF, NIH, and Gates-funded technology projects. She invented a novel acoustic-based technology for lung function monitoring that has the potential to predict when respiratory decline will occur days in advance. That's incredible. Um, her product's first application is in chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, a condition that sadly took her grandmother's life. She's now working with a team of engineers, designers, and machine learning experts to bring her invention to market with her startup company, Respira Labs, which has secured almost $2 million in pre-seed funding and has been accepted into Stanford's StartX Accelerator program. She was named Silicon Valley's 2018 Entrepreneur of the Year, 40 Under 40 Leader by the Silicon Valley Business Journey Journal, and one of the 100 U.S. rising stars uh, in the U.S. Maria has published in the New England Journal of Medicine and in Nature. Welcome, Maria. Um, and let me also welcome Dr. Renee Fossum. She's a research fellow at Procter & Gamble Fabric Care with 23 years of experience in upstream R&D. She has a PhD in chemistry from the University of Aust uh, Texas at Austin and is an inventor on over 80 published patents and patent applications. Her current role is to develop new materials for products like Tide and Downy that make clothes look better, feel better, and smell better. We can all appreciate that work. Uh, Renee is based in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, she's married to a chemistry professor and is the proud mother of four children. And uh, I'd also like to welcome Catherine Jin who is the CTO and co-founder of Kinos, a venture-backed company that is revolutionizing how we disinfect surfaces using color change feedback. The innovation uh, in infection prevention has spanned from the Ebola outbreak in West Africa to healthcare-associated infections in U.S. hospitals. For her work in global health, Catherine was named to Forbes 30 Under 30 in healthcare and was featured by the United Nations in celebration of International Day of Women and Girls in Science and was named to the inaugural list of the Temptus 40 Women to Watch. Wow, what an amazing group we have. Uh, welcome to, to all of you and thank you so much uh, for joining. Let, let me first uh, begin 
by focusing on the barriers. We heard from Elise um, about the barriers that um, IWPR gleaned from interviewing um, inventors. Um, but Maria, tell us your own uh, personal situation. What, what were some of the most significant barriers you faced as an inventor? Thank you for the question, um, Holly. Um, I'm a physician by training. I'm an engineer. Um, I, I literally wasn't trained to, you know, write patents or understanding how to create systems to solve, so, you know, to build solutions. Um, mo most of the barriers that I, fa that I faced were related to how to start, right? Um, how to write it, how to find uh, a patent lawyer. I'm, I'm privileged to be, and I'm very lucky to be located in, in Silicon Valley, right? In the San Francisco Bay Area. So in a way, the way where, the place where I'm, I'm, I'm living now um, helped me accelerate or I identify the people that I needed to reach out to. So what I did was uh, that I started talking to a lot of the other founders in the area. And, and after asking a lot of questions, right, and, and a lot of calls and, and texts here and there, I finally found my patent lawyer. I figured out a way of, you know, talking to other engineers, even doctors, and uh, trying to figure out the feasibility of what I had thought as an idea to begin experimenting on it. Um, so it, it's a mix of challenges and at the same time, um, you know, privileges for me particularly, but after I, I heard at least, you know, after listening to you, absolutely everything uh, that you mentioned in a way, in one way or another, I, I faced. So I'm more than happy to continue you know, talking about anecdotes and, and stories, but uh, I would like to hear more about, I don't know, Catherine, what do you think? What were your challenges, for example? Yeah, um, I think I had very similar challenges to you. Um, the first step is realizing that you have something really cool in your hands. And then the next step is wondering, what do you do next? And for a lot of women and people of color in this space, the what do you do next question, you can't answer on your own. I think the same for me. I remember when I was in high school, there was a boy in my year who patented a game that he and his dad had worked on. And I remember when I heard of that, I felt so behind. I didn't know what a patent was. I didn't feel like I could ever submit a patent. I was like, people already are submitting patents in a high school? That's crazy. And when I first, you know, invented Highlight and we were trying to submit our first patents, the entire process was so, so obtuse to me because I think, you know, you learn how to write papers, scientific papers, kind of, sometimes in your science classes, but you don't learn how to write anything for a patent. So the ideas of claims or even just the general purpose of the patent is confusing to, to, to a first time founder. The idea that um, you want to put in sometimes decoy ideas to protect the original idea. There's so much strategy and planning that goes into submitting a patent that if you didn't think it through from the very beginning, you can cause a lot of problems for yourself down the line, which is exactly what happened to me. Um, when we first started Kinos, we were looking for a really inexpensive lawyer. Um, we found a family friend of a friend he helped us submit our first couple patents and it seemed like a great deal because it was only like a couple thousand dollars and we could use the money that we had gotten from Columbia. But then, you know, years later, after we had raised our first round of venture funding, our, our new expensive fancy lawyers are looking at our patents and they're telling us there's some major issues with the claims that you made. There's some major issues with the words that you used even. Like the difference between the word pigment and dye is crucial for our patent. But we had no idea. Our initial lawyer never told us, even though we had, you know, had some trainings out of like VentureWell, E-Team, et cetera, other cool entrepreneurship training programs. I still didn't know I wasn't supposed to be using one word over the other. And so retroactively, we had to spend quite a lot of money to fix that issue. And I can only imagine if we weren't a venture backed company, there is no way we would have been able to do that. And so often to me, it feels like the patent process primarily rewards people who have the privilege and ability to patent things, who yeah, already know how to absolutely. do it. But for anyone else, it's extremely difficult. And competing with the resources of a big company or a big law firm, if you don't have that behind you, also feels impossible. So I guess, yeah, that's a quick overview of my barriers, but I want to 
give some time to Renee as well. So thank you, and thank you for having me. So my experience is going to be very different because I belong to one of those big corporations with a lot of resources working at Procter & Gamble. But I still would say that even though we do file a lot of patents and we do keep a large patent portfolio, it is always a challenge to make sure you're balancing the potential of that future in innovation with the cost and the resources it takes to get there. Because just like um, Maria and Catherine, it is a black box until you work your way through it. And for me, I've been doing this for over 20 years because I was fortunate enough to start patenting as a new hire at PNG. And every time I go through a set of filings, I learn something new, whether it's partnering with a new attorney or the strategy we have to come up with in a different area, and then a tremendous amount going through the prosecution. And if you are an entrepreneur or someone who's just starting out, I think it can be very overwhelming of where to turn. I, looking back, I was very, very fortunate that I had two particular role models in my like first five years at PNG that really spent a lot of time with me. One was a patent agent who had tremendous passion for the area and taught me how to uh, what a patent application was and how to structure it and what claims meant and different types of patents. And the second mentor, a little bit later on, took it further to talk about, well, you need to know the art. You need to come up with the closest art. You need to peer review. You need to play the devil's advocate. You need to think, have a strategy, not just of what you're going to file, but, but a prosecution strategy when those rejections come back. And those two people really stand out in my mind as having a huge impact on skills that I've been able to take and use um, and train other people that work around me. So definitely a hard system. Renee, that, that's so important, I think, um, just the idea of finding those mentors, those people who will um, show you the, the informal rules, right? All those things that, that uh, women need to learn to, to be successful that, that you don't learn in school and uh, there, there's no simple way to learn them. You really need to learn that from somebody else. I want to touch on an experience that I think many women have had, and, and particularly women of color, which is this idea of being the only in the room. Um, I, I've certainly uh, experienced that in, in my legal career, um, and I bet, I bet all of you have experienced that too. Who, who'd like to uh, start on this issue? You know, tell us more about what it's like to be the only in the room and how did you deal with that? I'm happy to start. Um, Please. <laughs> um, I think I have a unique experience in the sense that, you know, often I am not only the only woman in the room, I'm the only Asian American person in the room. And I'm also usually the only person under the age of 40. Um, so I often feel like when I walk into a room, I stand out a lot. And that's how I felt, especially when I was pitching initially for our seed round. Um, we had just graduated college. We're basically just stomping the streets of New York, pitching anyone who had listened to us as first time founders, trying to get some money so we can make this project work. And, you know, you end up walking into a lot of rooms where everyone's looking at you and you don't know why everybody is looking at you. And there's a lot of things that range from slightly inappropriate to extremely inappropriate that happen that, you know, if I wanted to be my strongest feminist Catherine self, I wouldn't allow happen. But if I wanted to raise money for my company, um, I kind of had to. I remember once um, we were going through a due diligence session. So my two co-founders are uh, men. And one of the angel investors asked me, is this a threesome relationship? And I literally, like, my mouth dropped. I didn't even know what to say. I. I mean, A, he didn't ask that to my male founders, and B, he would have never asked that if I wasn't a young woman, right? And immediately, I think what really hurts about those situations is that you realize when people look at you, all they do see sometimes is just a piece of meat. And even though I wore glasses that day, so people would think I'm smart, and I'm purposely not wearing makeup, and I'm like not wearing heels so that I look as like serious scientist Catherine as possible, people don't take you seriously. They'll ask questions to my male co-founders, uh, one thing that bothered me a lot when I was a female co I mean, as a female co-founder is like, people always ask me, so who invented this technology? And I'm like, I'm the CTO. 
I invented this technology. And I have received so many reactions from like mild shock to extreme shock, but I'm always, always so deeply insulted by their shock because I always wonder what did they look at me and think about me before, you know, what were their um, thoughts that they were bringing to the table and how were they already underestimating me? And I think often I go into events thinking I need to prove myself. I can't just be good. I have to be as good as I can possibly be. Otherwise, you know, I'm letting myself down and I'm also letting down other young women, other young people of color that are in this space as well. If I don't portray myself the best way possible. And so, yeah, I mean, I also think investors sometimes have a bad habit of like wanting to do the cheek kiss and then they'll like be too close for a while. And, you know, again, it's navigating that as a woman. What do I do if I want to receive funding for my company? I want to build this idea that I'm passionate about. That I think can save the world. But at the same time, I got to swallow sometimes the gross stuff that old white men are doing. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, we, we can relate. Uh, Maria, did you want to add to this conversation? <laughs> I mean, I love this. <laughs> Catherine, I love your uh, intervention. Um, so it's interesting. Uh, I'm 41, so I've gone through all of these things in my life. In a way, I think the attitude, attitude that I'm trying to garner right now, it's a little bit different in a way of uh, thinking that this is the status quo and it's gonna it's going to be extremely hard for me as an only individual to try to change things around. So... I'm always, yes, the only, you know, Latin American female with an accent, uh, especially here in the Valley, right? Uh, every single founder, at least most of them are, you know, males of, you know, graduating from Stanford, MIT, et cetera, with a heavy, like, technical background. Um, but in a way, I'm trying, I'm always trying to use my ethnicity and my, like, you know, personal characteristics to be memorable, right? In a way, I mean, I know my accent cannot be fixed, right? <laughs> As much as I try, as much glasses uh, that as I take, um, this is the way I am. This is the way I always speak. But uh, at the same time, I have a lot of passion for the thing, you know, the company that I'm building. I'm extremely motivated because it was something that you know, took my grandmother's life. So um, I faced a lot of things. I've gone through a lot of experiences. For example, um, there was a, a VC fund who happened to be oriented to only female founders, which I thought that they would be friends you know, more friendly or friendlier to me. And they, throughout the due diligence process, um, they actually wanted me to have a one-on-one -on -one with a firm, a law firm, to figure out my patents, right? I, this was, I mean, I wasn't even officially racing or anything. I wasn't really looking to having any money. Uh, they were trying to approach me and it felt technical, I mean, like, literally just like an oral board. They, in, in a way, I mean, coming from surgery, medicine, you get a lot of like oral tests when when you go through your the licensing. It, it, it was tough. Uh, even though like I brought my patent lawyer, she said to me, you know, I know that they invested in another company, also founded by another physician who happened to be male, but they didn't do that to, the, to him. So, I mean, people... If you know, if you ask anybody, right, like a male founder, no, it's just anecdotal what you're saying, Maria, right? I mean, like, it's just your sample size is what, one, two? <laughs> but I mean, to me, this is, you know, more than enough, right? The same fund, founders of the same background, you know, way similar characteristics because he's also uh, of color, um, not necessarily black or Latino, but again, he happens to be a guy. Um, so that was frustrating. We did not end up taking the money. Uh, for me, that was that, like a red flag. Um, it's definitely no other way to to do things. And I get a lot of questions about, you know, technical foundations, et cetera. Obviously, because I'm not an engineer, so in a way, I, I sort of like expect that. But at the same time, when I'm trying to, you know, when I'm I'm, I'm like not actively racing from VCs, I'm doing a lot of like the risk of the technology via, via uh, grants. But I do get a lot of questions um, or like I feel that the bar is always higher for me, right? Like when I talk to accelerators or incubators, even though they have done a lot of things as a solo founder, right? Trying to do a lot of bootstrapping, non dilutive money, uh, winning competitions, asking a lot of people belonging to a lot of communities so that I can have uh, this information for free. Um, they will always ask me to do more 
in order for them to give me the money. And when I talk to my male, co- you know, founders or colleagues, they they say to me, you know, Marie, I mean, for me, it's what, what, it was way easier, right? I mean, they just gave me the money with fewer milestones that you have accomplished because you've done a lot of things, <laughs> literally. And we don't understand why is this happening. So I'm always trying to figure out if what is happening to me is not a result, direct result of a, the fact that there are, you know, unconscious biases across, you know, everybody, right? Um, yeah. So what I do, and I think when I, I told this when we spoke uh, on, on this interview, is like, you know, um, I don't care anymore. I'm just going to make it happen, you know. I I'll, I move on, do next. I'll talk to other people, I'll figure out a way of making it work. I'll find a solution just to, also because in a way, to me, it's a personal challenge to show people that I'm capable of doing anything regardless of your nose, right? And it's, I'm extremely happy whenever I accomplish something new to like, you know, disclose it to the world, despite of everything, despite of my, you know, origins, national background, et cetera. I've accomplished this much, even though you thought that I would never make it. Thank you so much, Maria. We have some amazing uh, questions from the audience here, so I want to try to uh, reflect these in our conversation. Um, One issue that's coming up in our discussion and in the questions is this issue, and obviously came up in the IWPR findings too, is people uh, not understanding the patent process or even what an invention is. You know, let's let's sort of combine both your experience and also your recommendation. So, Renee, when did you first learn about what inventing and patenting is? When did you think of yourself as an inventor? When did you start thinking, I'm an inventor? Um, But also, you know, as a policy matter, when should we be teaching um, kids, undergrads, or whenever you think we should about this uh, process? So for me, I, so I'm a PhD chemist. So I've been in the area of research since I was an undergrad in college. So Technically, I've been inventing my whole scientific career, but I don't think I really realized what it meant to have an invention until I was working in industry and my line manager said, you need to go talk to the legal department because you have an invention to file. And even then, so, okay, you have this invention, understanding what type of invention it is, what kind of claim should be made, what kind of business opportunity there is out of it, what you really, really want to protect and own. That is a journey that I think I'm still on, quite honestly. So like I said a few minutes ago, I feel like this is a space where you're continually learning. Um, but as with each experience, you, you build more skills and more understanding. So today, it's so today, 20 years later, it's much easier for me to sit down either for my own work or a junior person and say, okay, well, this is what you have to do. These are the steps you need to take. This is the kind of data that you need to show relative to the other art that's out there. This is how you need to frame it and go start talking and having a conversation with the attorney. Um, so I think it's it's one of those things that If we could teach people younger in their education career, first in elementary school about how to be a divergent thinker, how to not take no for an answer and ask why and why not and how does this work, really create that kind of curiosity that really leads to novelty and to inventions. And then as people progress in their education, you know, as we've been talking today, I keep thinking, well, why isn't there a course? Why isn't there a course in in every kind of technical undergrad program that could be a course that gets input from industry, so small and large companies, to be able to at least put a framework together of this is what the landscape looks like and the kinds of steps you need to take. Case studies and examples are tremendous training tools because every patent we file is unique. The art's different your invention's different, the examiner that you get is different, where it's going to be practiced is different. So you need to be able to build a really comprehensive training program 
to be able to educate people going forward. And when I think of my own career, I was incredibly fortunate. If I wouldn't have had those two mentors at the beginning of my career, I don't think I'd be sitting here today with the kind of um, patent record that I do. Um, but luckily, we've got a more systemic approach at Procter & Gamble today where IP skills training is something that everyone in R&D has the opportunity and it actually is as expected to participate in. It builds depending on your assignment and your level and years with the company, but at least everyone who comes in the door, whether you stay in an, in an R&D field as an inventor or whether you move into the management system, is at least getting um, this kind of baseline training of the steps that you need to take. And I really think that that is a big part of why when we look at female inventorship for Procter & Gamble that relatively speaking, we're doing pretty well. And we'll, we'll keep trying to improve. That's terrific. That That's that's great to hear. And we hope that more and more companies uh, emulate uh, that, that leadership. Um, I want to uh, ask this other question that we've gotten in the chat, which is, how can patent attorneys do better? <laughs> well, you know, when you think of your experiences uh, with patent attorneys, what what jumps to your mind? What you know? What are some things for for those patent attorneys in the audience uh, that are listening? Um, how can they be part of the solution here? Anybody want to jump I, in on that one? Sorry, guys. I'm going to go first. <laughs> 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 so I, I I found my partner, uh, patent lawyer through uh, another founder um, through the Forgotten Institute of Innovation. She's amazing. Um, so she's, I would say patenting is very, you know, it could be very scary, right? For, for people who have mm -hmm. never done it before. Right. So trying to educate uh, the entrepreneur, right? The founder to, you know, walk them through the entire process, similarly to what Renee was mentioning about her mentors, right? Um, having understanding that, uh, and I always tell her, I'm going to ask you very stupid questions. <laughs> so mm -hmm. that's extremely important, you know, education at the same time, a lot of pa patience and, you know, working together as a team. Um, she's extremely affordable in a way that she's, she's trying to support me as a founder and we, we got this pretty strong connection because she wants to work with female founders. So she's intentionally trying to give me better rates. So, or, you know, in some ways we have even spoke about doing some sort of equity, you know, a, a deal to, to make things, you know, uh, affordable for me and obviously to um, increase, develop our portfolio. So I would say that because when I try to talk to other patent lawyers, I don't know. They seem to be dating sometimes when they speak. They, I don't know if it's obviously, they are obviously very smart, but in a way when you start, you know, throwing buzzwords here and there, it, it could be difficult for you to, to work together. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I also want to make sure to give each of our speakers a chance to talk about the, the benefits of inventing and patenting. All of you have overcome the many barriers. You've been successful in your different fields. Um, and what what have you gained from it? And what is it that uh, has helped you face these barriers uh, and overcome them? Uh, Renee, do you want to start? Sure, I can start. So um, for me, so being in upstream research, I really feel like the patents that I've worked on and especially the granted patents have been some of my biggest contributions to the company and, and, and to eventually if things make it to market to consumers lives. So for me, I get personal satisfaction out of that. So it's worth the time and investment to have the multiple conversations to keep trying, you know, if you've met with resistance to keep trying to come at it a different way. Um, and two, I just, I, I enjoy, I enjoy the learning aspect of it. I think coming up with the strategy and then when your strategy comes to life and you get the grant, those are some of the best days. So when I, it, to build on something Maria said earlier, or the question about what can patent attorneys do better, I can think of examples. I've worked with a lot of patent attorneys, but the ones who sit down 
with the inventors and have a strategy session together and try to speak the same language yeah. and and craft the claims together that will meet the strategy are when we're most successful. So I can think of an example of a partnership that I had where it was a shot in the dark. We didn't think we had any chance we were going to get that grant, but because of what we invested in, we were able to get that grant. And I can still remember the day he told me how exciting that was. Um, mm -hmm. And then, and then it, it became useful for the company. So then it became a business, had some business merit to it as well. That's fantastic. Catherine, how about you? Yeah, so I still remember when we, now we have 13 issued patents, which is crazy sometimes heels, but when we mm -hmm. first got our issued patent, I remember our lawyer sent us the email and it was in such legalese that I didn't even understand what the email meant. And I had to email back, what does this email mean? And Same then here. they responded like, oh, this means your patent was, you, you got your patent. And I was like, that was extremely unclear from your lawyer speak. And if I had to say something about lawyers stepping up is understanding how, you know, they work in an extremely niche area. And as a scientist, the, my first inclination to think through inventions in my work isn't through that same pipeline of strategy. So even just breaking it down and talking about the different priorities, the different audiences as a scientist versus a patent lawyer, I think that can help a lot. Um, the best things that I have learned are just honestly from my friends who are studying to be patent lawyers and I get to hear it from their side, um, exactly what they're doing, what their priorities are, what they're learning. And I think that also just gives me a lot more visibility into the whole process. Um, and I guess that's an aside, but um, I still remember that moment. It was really exciting for me. And all, honestly, for the past couple of years, we've been building this IP portfolio a lot bigger. And now when I get a patent, I don't feel that same joy and excitement anymore. But, you know, my team members, uh, they do. And seeing, mm. you know, my team get excited about that is really exciting. And you know, I, I got this question once someone asked me and I had never thought about it before, but someone had asked me, like, how did you build such a diverse team? And my answer was, I just built a diverse team like there was nothing to do, you know, and I think even now, you know, when we are getting these patents, I'm just so excited that not only am I, you know, having this achievement for my company, but at the same time, like, you know, some of my scientists have told me, like, you know, I don't think I would have been ever, ever able to get this otherwise and that a that makes me feel great because i'm like that's awesome i'm really glad to help you check something off the bucket list but also that makes me just feel so again frustrated about the lack of access and um the lack of i guess universal understanding of how to get a patent um how frustrating it is for the average person so yeah i'm i i would say that if you want to succeed especially in a STEM field, as a startup founder, you need to be really, really open-minded about understanding how patents and patent law works. And at the same time, you know, all that information and all those learnings that you collect, try your best to pass it on. Whenever I meet um, a student team or I get advice from people and they're asking me what they should do about their patents, et cetera, I make sure I tell them the biggest lessons that I've learned um, make sure to give them, you know, don't make these 10 mistakes that I made. Don't find a really cheap family friend of a friend lawyer. If it's less than a thousand dollars, you're not getting anything, you know, like that did things that are too good to be true. And so, yeah, I think as long as we can keep building this network of women who are, you know, excited to share and learn from each other. And, you know, I'm just also just so excited to hear so many, um, great things thrown out today in this discussion, talking about access, especially early access for young women, young kids, young people of color. Um, yeah, and I and I really hope and have a lot of faith that, you know, we will see patent parity, hopefully in my lifetime. Thank you so much, Catherine. We, we want your cheat sheet for sure. <laughs> ah, yeah. Maria, we're gonna uh, give you the last word on this question. Oh my gosh. What's the question? <laughs> <laughs> so, so tell us the benefits that, that you've received out of inventing and patenting. What has that meant oh. in your life? Well, a lot. Whenever I talk to, I mean, the business of creating a startup is all about risks, right? So you're trying always to go through your checklist, right? Like your product, your market, et cetera. And when you have a patent, you take a lot of that weight out. Um, so for, a, for an investor, it's way, you know, easier to help them make that decision because you have a way of 
protecting or to keeping your competitors uh, outside of your you know particular market. Um, so from a business perspective, that's perfect. We've been granted three patents in less than three years, and we are filing like crazy. We just filed two more patents yesterday. Uh, I've seen a lot of interest whenever I say, you know, another button granted on my LinkedIn, and I get a lot of likes, and you see, you know, uh, funds are reaching out, even though, like, we are not actively raising from, from big funds right now. So I think it's a good business decision, but of course it's extremely expensive. Um, and, and, and at least in my case, I, I've been very fortunate and privileged to have been granting, granted you know, the, the awards from NSF and NIH. And at the same time, some, some of my own personal savings, uh, I've invested into the company, which is obviously, as at least you were saying, right? I mean, I'm technically part of the top 1% of that you know, minority people who happen to be, you know, in a way, wealthy, privileged. I come, I'm, I'm a, I was a physician, I was practicing, and I, I gone to, you know, top, like, very, very well-ranked universities in the U.S. So, I mean, in my case, it's very hard to replicate amongst my minority uh, group, like Latin Americans or Latino, even, you know, Black. Um, because of that. But at the same time, I have a lot of, you know, lessons learned from, from my own experience. And I always try to educate other people who look or speak like me about it. And I'm always, you know, happy to mentor and like help anybody. Uh, well, I want to thank uh, Maria, Catherine and uh, Renee for these amazing uh, insights uh, and helping us understand what it's like to, to be a woman inventor today. And I want to thank Elise and IWPR for this exciting new research. Uh, and please uh, take a look at their website, iwpr.org. Take a look at the findings. And of course, at Invent Together, we're going to use this work and these insights from women inventors to continue uh, pressing forward on policy changes. So please visit us at inventtogether.org. Uh, and thank you so much to our audience uh, for joining us today. Ha have a great day.